Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. This is another episode of Queens of Crime at War, a series looking at what the best writers from the golden age of detective fiction did once that period came to an end with the start of the Second World War. So far in this series, we've spent time with writers who mostly saw out the war in London or in the south of England. And while the UK's capital city does loom large in the literary history of the time, it's by no means the only place of interest to the curious crime fiction fan. And that's why today we're heading north, to a city on the edge of the Scottish Highlands, where one of the most fascinating and elusive writers of the Golden Age spent the years of World War II. She is, of course, Josephine Tay. The She Done It Pledge Drive is still running, and we've made terrific progress towards my goal of adding 100 new members to the She Done It Book Club by the end of 2021. In fact, at the time of writing, we're over two thirds of the way there, and it's been such a delight to welcome new members into the club just as we're gearing up to read some festive mysteries before the year comes to a close. And speaking of festive mysteries, I want to highlight an aspect of being a club member that's designed specifically for this time of year. For the next month, I'm running the She Done It Holiday Book Concierge. If you join the club at the higher level, you get to use me as your own personal shopper. You send me some information about the mystery fan you're buying books for this festive season, and I will send you back my expert, customised recommendations for what titles you should get them. Because crafting these lists properly takes a lot of time, I only offer this service once a year and to the higher tier members of the book club, so if you want it, you need to sign up now. Plus, if you sign up at this higher level before we hit the pledge drive goal, I'll send you a She Done It bookmark free of charge to add to your gift. And of course, once you're a member of the book club, you'll get all of the non-seasonal benefits like extra episodes of the show, audiobooks read by me, access to the secret club forum and community, the monthly reading discussion and watching party as well. Those are available year round, but if you want to take advantage of the holiday book concierge, it's only open until the 15th of December, so you need to join now. And you can do that by heading to shedoneitshow.com slash pledge drive or clicking on the link in the episode description. Now, let's get on with the episode. I've always been fascinated by Josephine Tay because of how few traces there are of her among the general hubbub of the golden age of detective fiction. She wasn't a member of the Detection Club in the 1930s, so she was never part of that collective of crime writers who met regularly and collaborated on projects like round-robin novels and radio broadcasts. She didn't work as a critic either so she wasn't reviewing other writers' work or in a dialogue with them in that way. And perhaps most importantly, she wasn't often physically in the place where much of the meeting and mingling in British literary society went on. Although Tay is generally acknowledged today to be a queen of crime, and is frequently mentioned in the same breath as writers like Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, it feels like a grouping that we've created with hindsight, rather than one that necessarily existed at the time. You only have to look at her bibliography to see how she stands apart from these other writers. Josephine Tay was a pseudonym, of course, one of two used by Scottish writer Elizabeth or Beth Mackintosh throughout her life. And confusingly, there was no clear separation between the Josephine Tay name and her other pen name, Gordon Daviot. In 1929, she published her first mystery novel, The Man in the Queue, as Gordon Daviot. And then there was a gap of over a decade before her second Who Done It, A Shilling for Candles, appeared under the name Josephine Tay in 1936. Then her crime writing took another hiatus until 1946, when Miss Pym Disposes was published. And after that, several more Josephine Tay novels followed in quick succession. This is a very different publication pattern to someone like Agatha Christie, of course, who published at least a book a year for over 50 years, many of them detective novels, or Dorothy L. Sayers, who, for the period that she was writing crime fiction, was producing it pretty regularly. There are far fewer Josephine Tay detective novels, and they popped up sporadically among many other kinds of writing that Beth McIntosh was doing. Even more intriguingly, many of her most highly regarded mysteries, such as The Daughter of Time and The Franchise Affair, 
appear in a compressed period straight after the Second World War. It was as though Josephine Tay was having her own golden age post-1945, and I want to understand why. So of course, I decided to ask an expert. I'm Jennifer Morag henderson and I am the author of the biography of Josephine Tay. There's really nobody better than Jennifer to give us an idea of Josephine Tay's literary standing at the start of the Second World War, since her biography tells the story not just of Tay as a crime writer, but of Gordon Daviot the playwright and Beth McIntosh the person, too. Yeah, so she's probably still best known as a playwright, probably still best known as Gordon Daviot. She has published two mysteries by the time of the Second World War, but the first one of the mysteries was even published under the name Gordon Daviot. So the name Josephine Tay is kind of out there and there has been a book published and in America that's the name the books are coming out under. But probably in Britain she's best known for Richard of Bordeaux, her play with John Gielgud. This play, Richard of Bordeaux, had been a massive success for her. It was her first big West End production and since it also catapulted its star and director John Gielgud into a new echelon of fame, the name of Gordon Daviot became well known in theatrical circles too. But by the end of the 1930s, that name wasn't riding quite so high. Richard of Bordeaux is 1933, so there's she's kind of in a difficult position at the start of the war because she's had a couple of plays that haven't been like massive commercial hits. Production of plays is halted and production of books is slowed. She's perhaps not in the best professional position because although she's a well-known name, she's not like the most current name in theatre or, or novels. Although there was a Josephine Tay novel in 1936, her first since 1929, the 1930s was a decade dominated by playwriting, as Gordon Daviot tried to build on the success of Richard of Bordeaux. And then she writes a follow-up. And the follow-up is quite different and doesn't really do the same as Richard did. And then the next follow-up, Queen of Scots, is supposed to be quite like Richard, but again, it doesn't quite... She's not got a run of plays where she's like like a hit maker, like Dodie Smith. As Jennifer said, the wartime restrictions on theatrical production rather brought this run of years focusing on the theatre to an end, although Tay by no means abandoned her playwriting work. The declaration of war in 1939 found her at home in Scotland, as always dividing her attention between her ties to her family and her friends and relations down in London. She's in Inverness. So she's been back in Inverness for, yeah, a good long time, almost almost two decades by that point since she's moved back to Inverness. So she's living with her father, who is running his fruit shop. And she keeps house for her father, which probably means she's also involved in the family business, possibly to the extent of doing accounts for the fruit shop. By this time, Josephine Tay had been back in Inverness for nearly 20 years. Born and brought up in this town that is sometimes referred to as the gateway to the Highlands, she had left after school to train as a physical education teacher and then worked at various schools in England after gaining her qualification. This all changed in the early 1920s, though, when her mother became ill. Tay moved back home to care for her, and after her mother died in 1923, she stayed permanently to be near her father. This had been a big change to her life plan, but by the time the Second World War began, that alteration was far in the past. Life in Inverness had a set rhythm to it for her, and there were advantages to not relying entirely on her writing for her living. I don't know that for certain, but that's what I would imagine she would be doing, because it was always a family business. She certainly wasn't involved in the day-to-day running of the fruit shop. Her father had two shop assistants and he went down every day, but she did not. She would be in the house and she'd have time to write. And from her output after the Second World War, she's definitely, she's writing all the time at this point. It kind of works for Beth. It does give her the freedom that she needs to write because she's she's not on a publishing schedule because she has this family business in the background that she can rely on for money as well. So I think Sometimes people do say, oh, oh, she was stuck in Inverness, but I do think it does work for her in some ways. Alongside her writing, Beth was helping her father's greengrocery business adjust to the changes that war had brought. Because of her father's job, obviously rationing comes in, food restrictions. As a, a shopkeeper, he's like dealing with that every single day. I've got a few letters 
of Josephine Tays from the war years. And, but I've also got, because I'm in contact with her family, I've got a few letters from her father throughout the war years just talking about the family situation and, and Josephine Tay and also her sisters. And a lot of those letters, it's about the difficulties in the shop, getting food, customers complaining because they can't get the fresh fruit and vegetables, like even like the shortages that they're dealing with. He's trying to send food down to his youngest daughter in London. So there's all, all those kind of just the practical day to day things that were happening for everybody in the Second World War. But it's not just in the shop that there are a lot of changes. Although there's no active fighting in Scotland during the war and it's a long way from the front line, the war was still a very physical presence in Josephine Tay's hometown. So Inverness would have been a very militarised city. Well, it was a town at that point because there are army headquarters here. And just the same as in the First World War, there was a massive movement of troops by train and they would have gathered at the Cameron Barracks near Inverness. It's one of the staging points where everybody comes to. And Inverness changes really quite dramatically throughout the war. Everyone who lives in Inverness has to have a pass to get north of the Caledonian Canal because the whole area becomes restricted for military because there's a massive naval base just north of Inverness and they control they control who's going in and who's out. They want to know who everyone is. They want to make sure there's no aliens in the area. It's restrictive for daily life in Inverness because the Caledonian Canal, like it's just, it's 10 minutes walk from my house. I live in the centre of Inverness. So it's not a theoretical thing. You are carrying a pass with you all the time. There are soldiers all around you in town. As the war progresses, there's a big American military base in Inverness as well. There's a lot happening. It's a major military centre. So she would have been extremely aware of the war right from the beginning. One other major restriction that the advent of war placed on Josephine Tay's life was the need to stay at home. Trips to London to see friends and colleagues in the theatre or to visit her sister who lived there became few and far between. Definitely travel would have been much harder. And she was used to kind of taking holidays to see her friends down in London and her family down in London. And that would have been much harder. I've got a couple of letters, actually, which are really interesting. She was actually down in London, very near the start of the outbreak of the Second World War. And she describes how she's kind of walking through empty streets and everybody knows something's about to happen. And there's this kind of atmosphere. But for a writer, as they say everything's copy. Although unlike some of the other writers I've covered in this series so far, Tay doesn't start writing mysteries set in the Blitz. The tension of wartime Britain instead inspires her to write about another uncertain time in her island's history. But what I find absolutely fascinating is that this then inspires a play, Valerius, which is about Roman soldiers on Hadrian's Wall thinking about the invasion of the barbarians. You, you can really watch like the way she thinks and gets inspiration as a writer. She starts with one thing and then she starts firing off in all these other different directions, thinking about different things. And it's the atmosphere, it's how, how people feel. That's what she's trying to capture. After the break, Josephine Tay's Golden Age. This episode is sponsored by Orphan Black, an audio fiction series from Realm. This sci-fi thriller is an official continuation of the hit TV series of the same name. It stars award-winning actress Tatiana Maslany and picks up the story eight years later, when the original Sestras have been free to live quiet, anonymous lives since their victory over the evil project leader. But that anonymity comes at a cost, Cosima is unable to pursue the cutting-edge science that saved her life, Sarah's daughter Kira is suffocated by her mother's insistence on secrecy, and Charlotte, the youngest leader clone, questions why her family gets to survive, while other unaware clones get sick and die. Everything changes when Vivi Valdez, a CIA agent, discovers that she too is a clone, and goes rogue. Vivi's pursuit of the truth brings chaos to the original clone club when one of them is accused of murder. To prove their innocence, they must step out of the shadows and publicly claim the secret they've sacrificed everything to protect. Family ties will be tested, 
long-lasting alliance is betrayed, and the future of all clones hangs in the balance. If you were a fan of the original Orphan Black TV show, or if you weren't but you like sci-fi thrillers with queer themes and mysteries, then you'll love Orphan Black. Season 2 is publishing now, and it's a full cast production with loads of talented voice actors involved, as well as the multi-talented Tatiana Maslany reprising her lead role. You can check out the whole Realm slate at realm.fm, and you can listen to Orphan Black Season 2 now. It's available via the link in the episode description, or by searching wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is also sponsored by Milk Bar. We all have that friend who says they value experiences over things, which makes them sound edgy and cool, but really hard to buy for. Give them a Milk Bar cake for a gift, so they can experience literally the most delicious thing ever. Milk Bar was founded by master baker Christina Tozzi in 2008, and together with her team, she's been wowing the world with her unique spin on iconic flavours ever since. I was lucky enough to have a Milk Bar cake at a celebration on a pre-pandemic trip to New York, and let me tell you, it's still up there as one of the best I've ever eaten. That particular cake was their signature birthday cake, and it was the kind of cake that people are enjoying way too much to be polite about. There was no more, oh no, you have the last slice, I insist and instead plenty of can we split that bit because I really want to eat more of it. A few of Milk Bar's bestsellers include the aforementioned birthday cake, the salty sweet compost cookie, and the Milk Bar pie, which has a toasted oat crust with a gooey butter filling. And at the moment, they have some mouth-watering seasonal treats on offer, including the apple cider donut cake and the apple cider donut truffle dozen. These would make the perfect gift for a friend or loved one that you're thinking about at this time of year, If you're ready to win the holidays this year, you can even take the traditional gift up a notch or ten with an epic milk bar treat. Every milk bar creation is thoughtfully and beautifully packaged, made fresh then flash frozen, and they offer fast, even overnight, nationwide delivery across the US. Right now, Milk Bar has a special limited time offer. Get $10 off any order of $50 or more when you go to milkbarstore.com slash shedoneit. You'll get $10 off an order of $50 or more by going to milkbarstore.com slash she done it. That's milkbarstore.com slash she done it. The Second World War didn't prompt Josephine Tay to start writing mysteries that were explicitly about wartime conditions, but she did keep writing throughout those years. She kind of almost uses it to explore different things. So at the beginning of the war, she's had novels published, she'd had a biography published, please. Um, but she's not kind of in this sort of commercial fiction, publish one book a year, the publisher is waiting for you. So what she does is I think she kind of starts exploring different ideas in different forms. And she goes back to short stories, which I find quite interesting. That's how she started her writing. There was a real demand for short stories because people were sitting in the evenings wanting something to read and sitting in, in their house with the curtains drawn. And so she publishes a short story for the first time in in years, right at the beginning of the the Second World War. As Gordon Daviot, she had begun publishing short fiction in newspapers and magazines when she was very young. That was how she got her start in writing. Now, with a renewed demand for short-form, easy-to-consume literature, she felt inspired to return to those roots. Short was a common request from editors of all kinds at this time, and it seems to be a demand that suited Tay well. And then she kind of continues to explore this short form by writing short plays, several of which are broadcast on BBC Radio. And again, that's the thing that there was a demand for at that time was quality entertainment that could kind of take people out of their their situation. But it wasn't just in form that her work was changing. And the other thing is her style kind of evolves a little bit. She starts sort of at the beginning of the war, she's quite interested in quite serious things. And then she starts writing these quite light things as well, the kind of almost comedies like entertainment, like little short funny plays. I think that's maybe a reaction to realising people do need entertainment and just kind of this, let's get on with it. And I mean, there, there can be quite serious themes underneath the comedy, but yeah, they're definitely exploring something lighter. As the war nears its end, the demand for Tay's writing begins to pick up again. So it starts with plays. There was a play that she'd written right at the beginning of the the Second World War, and then it doesn't get put on until afterwards. And also Valerius, this play that she writes in response to the feeling that she had at the beginning of the war, it's got practically an all-male cast. And she felt that it almost shouldn't be put on 
until men were back from fighting. Otherwise, the people that were in it would be people who had chosen not to fight. And obviously, theatres are closed and restricted. So the first thing that happens after the Second World War is this explosion in her playwriting getting published. And then she begins to diversify into other genres, producing fiction at a rapid rate, unlike anything she's done before. But then she's obviously also decided that she needs another outlet. So she starts writing what become the Josephine Tay crime novels, starting with Miss Pym Disposes. This sudden flowering of mystery writing from Miss Pym Disposes onwards is what I think represents Josephine Tay's own golden age. And to explain it fully, I need to take you back to her bibliography again. Remember, we've had two mysteries from her before the Second World War, A Man in the Queue in 1929 and A Shilling for Candles in 1936. And then after 1945, there is, by Tay's standards, a sudden deluge of crime fiction. Miss Pym Disposes comes out in 1946, then The Franchise Affair in 1948, Brat Farrah in 1949, To Love and Be Wise in 1950, and The Daughter of Time in 1951. Josephine Tay is suddenly writing a mystery a year, almost. What caused this switch in her habits? Partly, Jennifer says, it just reflects her own changing tastes. I think it's partly what she was interested in. She didn't write to commission. She wasn't on a schedule. She wasn't on a publishing schedule. She wrote what she wanted to write. Again, this is where Tay's life in Inverness and her involvement in her father's business are relevant. Since she was free from the requirement to support herself and her family entirely from writing, she could follow her own enthusiasms in a way that perhaps some of the other crime writers at this time weren't able to do. We see evidence of this in that first post-war novel, Miss Pym Disposes, Jennifer says, which is generally marketed today as a mystery, but is really a very hard book to classify. In the Penguin Archive, when Miss Pym Disposes is published, there's letters and they have this discussion about whether or not it's actually a crime novel. Should it be published under the crime novel imprint? Like, should it be like an orange green penguin crime thing? And if you think about that when you're reading it, if it wasn't marketed as a crime novel, would you actually think that it was one? Because the crime doesn't happen till quite late on in the book. It's all kind of this atmosphere of how people are feeling. We actually read Miss Pym Disposes very recently in the She Done It book club. And I can confirm that the debate over whether it's really a crime novel or not is still very much alive today. But regardless of its exact genre classification... This book and the others that Tay was publishing in the years immediately following the war were popular, and she began to get offers to do more. Rather than become formulaic or repetitive, though, she simply takes the ideas she has and fits them into the more recognisable structures of the detective novel. And I think maybe the the success of the first one then leads to people saying, well, can you write another crime novel? So when someone is asking her to do something, she's She takes what she's interested in and puts it in this format. And there's this, the quote that she says that crime writing is like writing a sonnet, like it's a structure and you put something into the structure. And I think that's what she does so well is she takes what she's interested in. She's writing absolutely what she wants, but then she's got this structure to hang it on. And you see that with the daughter of time. I mean, you could, how could you pitch that? How could you pitch it as a book? let alone as a crime novel, but she manages to do it. It's fantastic. Suddenly, Josephine Tay is a hot property in publishing. It is the time in her life when a publisher is saying, have you got another book like this for next year? People want the next Josephine Tay. And they're they're getting fantastic reviews, both in the UK and the US. So yeah, it it must have improved her reputation and expanded her readership and just made her feel that there was a demand for what she was doing. Whereas before the war, Beth McIntosh was probably best known as the playwright Gordon Daviot. As the 1940s draw to a close, she is now, first and foremost, Josephine Tay. Yeah, she she is known as Josephine Tay. I mean, that those are the books that have survived. Those, those are the ones that, that people are reading and talking about. Meanwhile... Things aren't going quite so well in Tay's personal life. So one of the very first things that happens is her brother-in-law is killed. And that's obviously quite a big thing for the family. So one of her sisters is left widowed. Her younger sister marries during the war. 
So again, that's a that's a big change for the whole family. And she marries down in London, which means she doesn't move back to Inverness, which means Beth is left again with her father in Inverness to care for him. Um, and Colin, her father, he does start to have problems with his health during the war, which are just becoming more and more noticeable. So that is becoming like quite a big part of Beth's life, of Josephine Tay's life, that she's she's looking after him. Colin McIntosh finally passes away in 1950. For a while afterwards, Tay is able to do some of the things that the war and then her caring responsibilities have postponed. Travelling to see friends and family, going on holiday, seeing her own plays performed. There's loads of stuff to deal with when someone dies, like selling the family business. So she, she just thinks that she's exhausted from doing all of this. And she finally goes down to see her youngest sister and her new nephew in London. And her sister says, this is not just normal exhaustion. You need to go and see my doctor. And that's when Josephine Tay finds out that she has cancer. Josephine Tay's golden age was, sadly, very short-lived. And from that moment, the very end of her life is, is she has to stay with her youngest sister in London and she dies in London. And it's really very sad. She's not, she's not got time. She, she could have done more if she had time. Josephine Tay died of liver cancer in February 1952, having never really recovered from the exhaustion she felt while caring for her father. In her papers after her death, the manuscript for one last crime novel was found, The Singing Sands, which sees her detective Alan Grant take the trip back to Scotland that she would never manage herself. It was published posthumously later that same year. Although Jennifer's biography of Josephine Taylor has been out for a few years now, she's still following up leads and discovering fascinating new details about this extraordinary writer's all-too-brief life. And last year, she made a major new discovery. She found some letters between Josephine Tay and Dorothy L. Sayers, which confirmed that Tay was invited to join the detection club after all. The last letters, these new letters that I, I've just kind of read through between her and Dorothy L. Sayers, where Tay is invited to join the detection club. And um, she says, I'd love to join it, but I've got to just finish just a couple more things. There's something happening in my... F-. And if she only she'd had more time, I think that she could have... I think she would have ended up as a different writer and a different person. She could have taken advantage of talking with other crime writers and joining the detection club and and maybe that would have taken her work somewhere new. She was getting offers from America all the time. She would have maybe liked to travel. I find it very sad, the, what happens at the very end. I think it's always been assumed by fans and scholars that Tay was never invited to join the elite society in British crime writing because she was rarely in London and she didn't publish very many detective novels during the interwar period when The Whodunit was at the height of its popularity. But here is evidence that Tay's extraordinary late run of mysteries immediately after World War II did catch the eye of Detection Club co-founder Dorothy L. Sayers, and that had Tay not already been so ill, she might have forged new friendships and connections at this point in her career. It's very rare now that I see anything new with Josephine Tay, but to see just a couple of letters from her, and she's got such a distinctive turn of phrase, and it's so nice just to read it, and quite poignant as well, because the letters are kind of talking about maybe some of the towards the end of her life when she's ill it's not it's not such a happy time but yeah it was it was wonderful just hearing her voice one more time although this is an exciting discovery and full credit must go to jennifer for her loyal and dogged pursuit of these documents there is something bittersweet about these last letters josephine tay's golden age was cut short by her illness in the early 1950s but who knows what else she could have gone on to write This episode was written and narrated by me, Caroline Crampton. You can find details about all the books I mentioned in the description for this episode at shedoneitshow.com slash queensofcrimeatwar. I publish transcripts of every episode, including this one. Find them all at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. 
If you'd like to help me get to this year's Pledge Drive goal of 100 new members of the She Done It book club, head to shedoneitshow.com slash pledge drive. We're well over two thirds of the way there now. So if you'd like to take advantage of that buy one, get a free one to give offer, you better hurry. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese. Original music by Martin Zoltz Orstwick. Member support for the She Done It book club from Connor McLaughlin. The podcast's advertising partner is Multitude. Thanks for listening. The next episode in the Queens of Crime at War series will be out in a week's time. <laughs>